This evening, as I said, I'm going to uh, turn back again to John chapter 4, and we're going to look at just one facet of uh, what it is that Jesus had to say to the woman of Samaria. And um, I, I do want us to look particularly at what it means to be the kind of worshipers that the Lord is seeking. So what I'd like to do is read for you verses 19 through 24 of John chapter 4, which was our text from this morning. And basically, remember in this section where Jesus is seeking to show the woman of Samaria who he is, because unless she understands that he is the Christ, she won't be able to receive from him the living water that he has to offer. He tells her what her life was like and points out all the failed marriages that she had had and the fact that she was now living with a man out of wedlock. And after he shares that with her, we read in verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. May the Lord bless this part of his word again to our edification this evening. Now again, this morning we saw Jesus telling us that a time was coming when where one worshipped would become irrelevant. As we just saw in verse 21, woman, believe me, Jesus says, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Uh, The hour was coming, of course, when the temple worship would be defunct, as it were. It It would have been fulfilled by Uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross through his crucifixion. And of course, it would be entirely so, even though that worship would continue to go on for 40 years following, from around 30 A.D. to 70 A.D., it didn't have any effectiveness. And of course, once it's destroyed, it's done away with entirely. But I do believe Jesus was referring mainly to his crucifixion, which would take away the efficacy of that temple worship, which means you would no longer need to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. But even in Jesus' day, he says, how one worshiped was already important. Verse 23, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. I think we need to recognize that there is a sense in which that has always been true. This is the only kind of worship that the Father has ever accepted, even though the form of worship that he commanded may have varied, at least from the Old Testament or the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Now what I want us to consider this evening is basically that what was true in Jesus' day is certainly still true today. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That's going to be a recurring refrain, by the way, uh, through this sermon. So what I want us to consider this evening is what it means. What is Jesus talking about here? First, what it means to worship in spirit, and secondly, what it means to worship in truth. So first of all, what does it mean to worship in spirit? Well, I think Jesus likely has two things in mind here, one that may not be so obvious and another that is really quite obvious. I think he's talking about worship that is spiritual rather than physical, that is worshiping, as it were, uh, the invisible realities that we know are true by faith versus the physical things that God gave as symbols of his presence because we are moving in, in this particular statement that Jesus makes, We're moving from temple worship, from old covenant worship to new covenant worship. And secondly, I believe he's referring to worship that is empowered by the Spirit of God, which is the only way we can really worship in the way that I just referred to, moving, as it were, to the more spiritual worship of the new covenant. 
So first of all, I think he means by this that God is seeking those who will worship him in a spiritual way rather than physical, as it were. And I think it's clear from the context that Jesus has this in mind because of his answer to the Samaritan woman's question in verses 20 through 22. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. So basically she's asking, where's the right place to worship? Where is the location that you can worship and God will accept? Is it in this mountain, Gerizim, or in Jerusalem? Actually, I'm going to be making reference to Gerizim in, in several places, but Greg has uh, provided a slide we're going to look at later when I bring it up again. And what is the right form of worship? Which is the acceptable priesthood? Which is the right scripture? Now Jesus answered that question. He said the Jews were right. And we saw this morning why that was the case. Remember the Samaritans had set up an imitation basically of what God had ordained in Jerusalem. It wasn't the real thing. And God never accepts what man chooses to do in the place of what he commands. But Jesus said something was about to happen that would make the question itself irrelevant. Worship was going to be moving from a physical form and location, uh, from a visible way of worship, from that is the temple that was on earth, to a more spiritual or invisible way, to the temple that is in heaven. That was a rather significant change that took place as we moved from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant and from the shadows to the realities. This is one of the things that the author to the Hebrews had to address uh, to his readers as the church actually made that move, that, that worship basically had become more spiritual in its nature. Now the author to the Hebrews writes at a time when Jesus had been crucified about 40 years earlier and the destruction of the temple was really just around the corner. That worship had already been moved from the earthly temple to the temple that is in heaven by the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. There would no longer be any visible forms of worship as it were, at least as it existed in the Old Covenant. No more earthly priests because now we have a great high priest in heaven. No more animal sacrifices because now we have the only sacrifice that God would ever accept that has already been made once and for all. And of course, no more earthly temple in which to do it because the Lord was about to destroy that temple. Now the loss of these physical symbols of God's presence that they had known for such a long time was one of the things that made Jewish believers a little bit uneasy. Uh, that was one of the things that you know, made them wonder, well, should we stick with this spiritual worship should we go back to the visible form but when you add on top of that the persecution that Rome was bringing against the Christians as I've said over and over again that's what the author to the Hebrews was telling him because Rome was persecuting them they weren't persecuting the Jews because that was a legal religion but they were persecuting the Christians because they Rome was beginning to recognize that the Christians were not actually a part of the Jews the Jews were persecuting them and so they saw that they were not a part of, the, of that, really that only faith that Rome would allow. And so they were beginning to persecute the Christians and the temptation then to go back to the Old Testament shadows rather than holding on to Christ and his more spiritual form of worship when it could cost you your life. See, it became increasingly tempting. They were tempted to return. Of course, the authors of the Hebrews reminds them that if they did, if you turn away from Christ... If you side with the Jews and say that he deserved to be executed, he deserved to be crucified, then you're trampling underfoot the Son of Man and putting him to open shame. And he also says when the temple is destroyed, you're going to be destroyed with it. And that destruction was just around the corner. But again, ask yourself this question. If you happen to be in their situation, would you be willing to hold on to Christ? Would you be willing to hold on to his worship even if it meant that it could cost you 
your life. You realize, of course, the way things are going today, that someday it may actually uh, cost you that to hold on to Him, but you must be willing uh, to do it. New covenant worship is more spiritual in nature, and we must be willing to hold on to Christ and His standards and stand firm for Him no matter what the cost. But you know what? Throughout history, as I've mentioned before, many Christians have not been willing to give up the physical, uh, as it were, uh, in, in favor of the spiritual. Uh, they have to have that physical. They have to have something they can see. They have to have something that they can touch to convince them that these things are real. Their faith perhaps isn't strong enough to see the invisible. I think that's something, of course, that the Hebrews were struggling with. Is Christ and his kingdom and the things of heaven, are they really true? Or are the things we have been used to all these years, are these the truth? Am I willing to stake my life on it? Now again, as I've said, we have many examples in the history of the church of, of those who have professed faith in Christ, who can't let go of those, those physical things, those tangible things. For instance, those who are in the church of Rome. I think one of the things that those who are you know, part of the Catholic church really like are the, the trappings, the symbols, the holy ambiance as it were. They like the statues, they like the priests that are there, they like the, the daily sacrifice of the mass, they like the ornate buildings, they like the fact that there's somebody standing on earth that they can see that literally takes the place of Christ. They like visible things. And we know that even some Protestant churches have kind of fallen in that same pattern. I mean historically the Anglican church was just a step away from Rome at least with regard to the ornateness they have a similar environment, even though historically they've held to a much more biblical doctrine regarding salvation. Uh, Luther, during his day, believed that to get rid of the physical trappings, to get rid of the statues and the, and the, the stained glass and all the different uh, religious symbols would be to pull, as it were, the, uh, the, the pillars that are holding some weak Christians up, that they need these things to shore up their faith. And so he continued to defend them. But Reformed believers recognized that when the Old Covenant worship passed away, uh, that these are things that New, New Covenant believers didn't need any longer. The Lord doesn't want us to fix our eyes on things that are visible. He wants us to fix our eyes on the things that are invisible. He wants us to fix our eyes on Him, and He's no longer, as it were, in a building uh, that is on the earth as He was in those days, but He is in heaven. Jesus tells us God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit. New covenant worship is more spiritual. It's less ritual based. More faith is basically uh, what it's based upon. And we have to admit that even under the old covenant shadows that if you went through the motions that still didn't save you. The only way anyone was saved in, in that very uh, physical old covenant worship is by, was by seeing Christ, seeing Christ in, in the symbols, seeing Christ in the priesthood, seeing Christ in the sacrifices, seeing Christ in, in the promises God made. Uh, one had to look past, as it were, those physical symbols in order to see the spiritual realities. And those who did, of course, were saved. You know, the Lord really only gives us one visible symbol to look at these days. And, and though, you know, many Christian denominations may differ on it, it's really just the Lord's Supper. That's the only symbol He gives to us, the symbol of His body and His blood. But even there, we need to look past that. And we need to look at the reality because God is spirit. We need to worship Him in spirit and in truth. He desires that we worship Him in faith, that we believe His word. Now that's also why, secondly, worship needs to be in the Holy Spirit, in the power of the Spirit and not in the flesh. Because why is it that professing believers, why is it that historic Christians actually have these visible symbols? Why do they use them? It's because of the weakness of the flesh. They like crutches. The spiritual environment, they, 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 somehow that helps them. Somehow it, it proves that what they're doing is real, that what they're doing is, is significant. 
But again, I would just simply point to the Pharisees and the Sadducees as basically living proof, as well as many that are in churches that use a lot of symbols. And, and we have to admit, I mean, the, the, the struggle is, is in any church that physical symbols can't change your heart, that physical symbols don't help. But what really helps is the Spirit of God because the faith that the Spirit of God creates in the heart doesn't need these crutches. It doesn't need these visible things because it can see the invisible. It can see the invisible God all around. It can see the visible Son who is now invisibly out of our view in heaven. It can see the invisible temple that is in heaven. It can see that there, there are the holy angels and the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Faith apprehends these things. Faith sees these things. We know that they are true. We don't need physical representations in front of us to know that they are true. And again, let's not forget, the Spirit of God not only gives us the faith to see the reality of these things, but He also gives us the heart to desire what it is we do see. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit, and you cannot worship spiritually unless you have the spirit of God savingly in your heart. Now again, this is the kind of worshiper that God is looking for, one who is willing to worship him or one who is able to worship him in spirit. Now what does it mean to worship the Lord in truth? Well, this word also has many different meanings, but I think here it refers to at least two things. First of all, it refers to fact rather than opinion. And secondly, sincerity rather than hypocrisy. Now, it means, first of all, to worship according to fact. Now, I, I've already told you that we, we had a, a slide, and I think uh, now would be a good time to put it up. As you know, I mentioned this morning and already this evening, the Samaritans had their worship they had their temple on Mount Gerizim. And uh, I believe, as I understand this picture, and Greg, did you say you took this picture when you were there? The, uh, the, the mountain there on the left is Gerizim. The one on the right is Ebal, if I'm correct. And then in the middle, I think somewhere, it looks like a rather significant city, is Sychar, which we were looking at this morning where Jacob's uh, well was located. Now, the Samaritans had their worship. Again, the woman was asking, where's the right place to worship? Their temple was on top of this mountain. Now, one thing that's interesting is that um, from what I understood and what I said this morning, that temple was actually destroyed and rebuilt in a different location. But from what the Samaritan Pentateuch actually says, it's likely still on Mount Gerizim because that is the location where God said you must worship according to the Samaritan Pentateuch. So they had their temple on Mount Gerizim. They had their priests who were from the line of Manasseh, as we saw this morning, not the king of Judah, but Manasseh, who was from the line of Aaron. They had a standard. They had their version of the five books of Moses, the Samaritan Pentateuch. But that wasn't enough because as much as they might want to believe these things were true, as a matter of fact, they weren't true. They were not worshiping according to truth. They might have had a priest that was related to Aaron, but one who had been removed from the priestly office because he married uh, the daughter of Sanballat, the enemy of, of God's people. They had a standard that was close to the truth. They had the Samaritan Pentateuch, as I already told you. It was close to the truth, close to the Mosaic Pentateuch, but it wasn't a pure text, still isn't, as a matter of fact. It apparently differs with the Masoretic text of the, of the, Samar or the Mosaic Pentateuch in 6,000 places. That's in five books. Okay, five books, 6,000 differences. Now, most of those differences are minor, but one of the major differences is that the Samaritan Pentateuch uh, contains a command by God to build an altar on Mount Gerizim. And he said it was only on that mountain that he would accept the sacrifices that they were to make. That's a significant difference. It's altogether wrong, and because it is, what they were doing was not, it was not acceptable to God. The Samaritan Pentateuch kind of strikes me as a, uh, it's like an ancient version of what Charles Taze Russell tried to do when he rewrote the Bible and tried to exclude any reference to the deity of Christ. Uh, you want it to say one thing, and so you rewrite it to say that thing, and then you, you convince yourself that this is true. Somebody somewhere did this. 
And a lot of people have been following it ever since. We know who did the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible, but we don't know exactly who it is that distorted the Samaritan or the, the Pentateuch that the Samaritans have. But you see, God ordered the temple to be built in Jerusalem. He ordered that the sacrifices be offered by the Aaronic line, the sons of Aaron. Samaritan worship was not authorized by God. It was not acceptable to God. And so God did not bless it with his presence. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now again, the same is true today. That if our worship is to be acceptable to God, as we gather together on his holy day, uh, or in any other venue in which we would seek to worship the Lord, whether it be privately or as we meet on Wednesdays to worship Him, we have to worship Him according to the truth as He declares it in His Word. God will not simply accept whatever we choose to give Him. It has to be according to the Word of God. So does it matter where we worship the Lord? Not as long as we're gathered together by His Word and His Spirit. Does it matter how we worship him? Yes, it does. If the second commandment teaches us anything, it tells us that we cannot do whatever we want to do and think God is simply going to accept it. We must do what God tells us to do. Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me, and keep my commandments. We must worship the Lord according to truth. But we do need to look at the second aspect of what it means to worship God in truth. If we worship according to what the Word of God says, is God going to accept our worship? Well, not necessarily, because we know very well that we can have the right form, but not have the right heart. We also need to worship him in sincerity, which means we must believe these things and truly be seeking to do these things from the heart. You know, to have the right form without having the right heart is what we call formalism. Formalism is something that we all recognize as something that is not acceptable, something that is bad, because it means just to go through the motions and not really to be sincere in what it is we're doing. We do need to remember that God is not impressed by outward appearance. God looks at the heart to see whether or not our hearts are involved, whether or not we really love him. I think the classic example of this is when God sent Samuel to Bethlehem, remember, to anoint one of Jesse's sons, as king in place of Saul, we read in 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 and 7, when they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Apparently he was tall, he was handsome, he looked stately, he looked royal, looked like a king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Isn't that true? I mean, same thing's happening today, right? How many people does the world prize for having a sincere and honest heart? Not many. But how many do they praise for being tall in stature and handsome in appearance? Well, those are the idols that the world worships. Now, Jonathan Edwards pointed out in, in his day that one could feasibly construct a mannequin, basically a primitive robot of sorts, that could be made automatically to give food to the hungry. But the fact that it did something that was formally right did not make it pleasing to God. And the reason it didn't was because it lacked the right motive. This mannequin has no motive, right? The heart has to be right before God. There has to be a genuine love for God, a real desire to give Him glory. And if what you do is to be acceptable to Him, that is the way that you must offer it to Him. So again, if we go through the right motions in our worship, if we pray, if we sing psalms, hymns, and sing spiritual songs, if we listen to what God says in his word as it's being read and preached and even submit to that, 
outwardly, but our hearts are far from the Lord. If we don't really love Him, if we're not really seeking His glory in what we do, it really means nothing to the Lord. As a matter of fact, it's worse than nothing. It's sin. It's not pleasing to Him. It's offensive to Him. Our hearts have to be engaged. We have to be seeking for His glory. Paul tells us as much in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, that if there isn't love in the things we do, it is unacceptable to God. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal in the ears of God. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible because Christ gave to his disciples, even Judas, the ability to do miracles. Did he have love? No. Did it profit him? No, it did not profit him. He was nothing. He was worse than nothing. He was a devil. And he is in hell today. And then he says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. There are people who do this. And they don't do it out of love for God, who have even you know, given their lives for their cause, but have received nothing more than the enemies of God received because they didn't do it for His glory, they didn't do it according to His word, they did not do it out of love for Him. And how much more does it mean really nothing to the Lord if we go through the motions, not only with our hearts disengaged, but also our minds God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We need to worship him in the New Testament way, the new covenant way, using the spiritual forms that he has given to us. All of these things are, are basically spiritual in nature. I mean, there may be a man standing in a pulpit speaking to you, but this, you know, these words are Christ's words, and they are spirit, and they are life, and they are truth. We don't have the, the trappings, as it were. We've, we've got, um, I think we tried to get pretty much everything out of here. <laughs> because we want you to focus on the Lord. We want you to see Him. And of course, when we have the table, we've already talked about that. We need to worship in New Testament spiritual forms. We need to worship in the power of the Holy Spirit because that's the only way we can do this in faith. It's the only way we can do it with the kind of love that the Lord desires of us. We have to do it according to his word. It has to be according to the standards. And we must do so in sincerity of heart, which we will do, of course, if we have the spirit of God living within us. That's the kind of worship that God wants. That's the kind of worshiper that he seeks. Are you that kind of worshiper? Is that how you see yourself? Is that how you serve the Lord. Let's not, also, well, let's not forget as well that this isn't something God desires just in the worship service, as though we have to muster it up you know, for this hour, and this time it might actually be an hour, or for this, just this day, okay? but something he wants us to do with the whole of our lives. Again, a very familiar passage, Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, not only when we're meeting together on the Lord's Day to worship him, but throughout the entirety of our lives. And so the Lord encourages you this evening, if you would be that kind of worshiper that would worship him in this way, that would honor him in this way, you must do these three things. You must walk by the spirit. Paul says in Galatians 5.16, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. You need to walk by the Spirit as He leads you in the truth. Remember, God won't accept whatever we want to give Him. We have to walk according to His standards. John writes in 3 John, verse 4, it's only one chapter in that book, 
I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. And let's not forget, it's not enough to do that formally, you know, just to do it outwardly like the Pharisees did. You know, they were good at keeping up appearances. It has to be done sincerely. It has to be done from the heart, with a genuine love for him, a genuine desire to give him glory. The author of the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I think the author to the Hebrews basically included everything we looked at in this passage. So may the Lord give us the grace to do what he has called us to do, to live before him in the power of the Holy Spirit, to walk according to truth and to do so because that's what we really want to do, because we really do love him and really do desire his glory. We can only do that through the power Christ gives us. We must receive the living water as we saw this morning. We must come to Jesus, repent of our sins, trust in him and receive his Holy Spirit. And if we do, he will give us the power to live this kind of life. If you haven't come to Christ, I would again encourage you to do so. And if you have come to him, then I would encourage you again to use the means the Lord has given to you to gain more of the Spirit, that you may be filled with the Spirit, so that you may live this kind of life and worship the Lord in the way that he seeks you to worship him. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us do this.